Hey everybody, welcome to The Stoked Show, the show where I talk about all things that make me stoked. And on today's episode, we're going to talk about the thing that makes me stoked the most. My best friend, Gary Yang. Gary Yang, how are you doing today? Hey guys, I'm doing great. How are you doing, Tony? Oh, it's a wonderful day. The sun is shining. We've got a beautiful backdrop behind us. Nothing could be better. So, how does it feel now, a year and some change later, working together, and now we're doing a podcast together? Almost like, little... almost like when we did my first interview with you. It's a little weird, man. I never... I, like, put this team together. So I was like, oh, we're all friends. We're all paddling. And then all of a sudden, a year later, like, so much has happened. I feel like I'm still catching up to it mentally. Yeah, I think it's really weird when you look at it. Like, the, the just the weird cause and effects of how this team developed is, like, kind of bizarre. I was, like, literally thinking about this last night. Um, and I was thinking, I was like, man, how did one YouTube video like change my life dramatically? And it was like watching your Tallulah video back in the day before, (laughs) as I was just getting into kayaking. And then I like saw you at like a random pool session in Raleigh. And I was like, I think I know that guy. And then months later, like a couple months later, I'd be boating with you swimming like the, (laughs) like the wilderness (laughs) channel. And then how that would dramatically lead into us becoming best friends and then following that up with starting to work together and make like deciding to make the Portage Posse. Dude, what's what's worse is that I don't remember you at the pool session. Oh, for sure, I was pretty unmemorable <laughs> at the pool session. I I do remember a guy coming in a like neon green fluid spice up to me at the Whitewater Center, and I don't remember our conversation mostly, but you were like, you were basically asking me to show you down or something. No, you volunteered. I was like, I'm on the, I was like, I'm done for the day. And you were like, oh, have you been down the Wilderness Channel? And I was like, no, not yet. And you were like, oh, follow me. And that, I that said, uh, right. okay. <laughs> that sounds right. And we made it really far, dude. Like, we made it to before M-Wave. I remember checking in with you and being like, hey, like, do you, do you want to run down? And you did. And then you swam. I swam, I think, <laughs> I swam biscuits and gravy. Yeah, which is at the end. And then you took me out to sushi after that. Yeah, I had to really, like, butter him up. I, I, you know what's funny is, like, how many people we've told this story to and, like, how I basically paid for your friendship. <laughs> Dude, because you're, you're literally, like, because I was living out of my car. I still am. I need to buy a new one. Hopefully that happens today. But, um, yeah, you were like, you want to get sushi? And I was thinking, like, some, like, low-end, like, sushi place. And we went to some nice, like... I don't remember what it was called. It I was have a no nice idea. place. It was a really nice place. I, I remember you you made a comment about the, the price of some of the alcohol on the menu. And I yeah, don't, dude. I think when you looked at like the Japanese whiskey or something like that, and you were like, Jesus Christ, this is a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was where I was just like, I don't know what to do right now. Like, you ever, you ever, when someone pays for your food, you ever like awkwardly look at the menu and you're like, I don't want to buy things that are too expensive. But in this situation, everything there was expensive. I used to feel that way, and I, I still do, depending on the social situation. Mm-hmm. Like, if it's someone I don't know that well, or, like, we haven't already been to a nice restaurant before, we're like, we were like, no, no hold bars, go for <laughs> it, like, it's all you, um, then I will hold back, but mm-hmm. otherwise I'm like, okay, well, I'll get the next one anyway, so it's not a big deal. Fair enough. I did not get the next one. No. <laughs> <laughs> I did not get the next one. Well, I mean, I think, think about it this way, like, I think... You definitely were burdened with my inability of kayaking early on. And I, while that may not be the case anymore, there was definitely some dividends like we paid to some I don't extent. view it like that. Like, I enjoy going out with people that are, like, getting into the sport and fairly new and trying to get better. And um, you had a great attitude about it. I think it's important for, for everyone that's learning. Like, it's okay to not be good. It's, it's the attitude and, like, the learning process that matters. And you had a great attitude, and you were down to learn, and I was like, this is awesome. Like, I'll 100% vote with you. Which is interesting, because, like, even if you look at me as, like, the example in that situation, that, that's kind of been spread across everybody on the team. Like, mm-hmm. and I yeah. feel like that's obviously been pretty deliberate, like, as far as met who's been on our team. And, like, especially, I think, as we were talking about really starting the, the Portage Posse, um, that's what we wanted, was, like, good yeah. attitudes. Yeah, because I thought about it, and I was like, I, I'm not a good enough paddler to be, like, attracting the best paddlers in the world. And honestly, I don't really know if that's the, the life that I would want to live. Because I feel like that doesn't connect with normal people. Don't get me wrong, really good paddlers are really, really cool. And I wish I was a lot better than I, than I am. Um, 
But I think for a lot of normal people, which is the vast majority of the sport and really the vast majority of everything else, being able to see like regular people like Tony, like Ashley, like literally everyone else on the team participate in the sport and have fun and, and push their comfort and do crazy things like that, I think is far more important. So I was pretty specific on who was a part of the team and, and who I let in on this thing because I don't want to, one, like I just personally don't want to manage like 30,000 people, you know? Um, shout out to Kayak George. <laughs> well, I don't know, you're probably more than 30,000 now, but um, I just don't want to manage that many people. I just feel like it's I mean, I feel like it's hard it. enough managing the amount of people we yeah, do we have. Yeah, we have like six. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, I think the idea of like coordinating like us all on a single trip, I think sounded so much easier when we first started. Dude, and I think, I think we realistic, like as time has went on, I think we've done like maybe less than five trips where everybody's been together. You know what we need to do? We just need to all quit our jobs. <laughs> 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 Go full time into this YouTube thing. And, um... Maybe we can do that. Maybe we can have everyone. I would hope that if all of us were unemployed and, like, kayaking, I would hope that we could all kayak together with all oh, of the dude, additional free time. Oh, we 100% could. The, the issues would be, like... How do we eat? How do we, you know, like, afford a place life to live? Yeah, yeah. But we could definitely kayak together. Yeah, yeah. We could all just, like, commit to be, wor like, working at, like, for, like, a river company of some sort. Dude, we should start our own... We don't, I don't want to start a river company. I don't, I don't want to do that I don't either. want to do that. Like, I know too many owners, and, and none of them, they, they all love what they're doing. That's great. I don't love what they're doing. <laughs> so. I, in what way? Because I feel like that comes off really poorly when okay, you say it let like me, that. Okay, let me explain that. Um, so, in order to be successful at a river company, and this is coming from someone that doesn't have their own river company, so I might just be making things up here, but you have to give up a lot of holidays because that's where a lot of your business is coming in. You have to be in one location a lot of times because you have to physically manage that company. Um, sure, you could eventually maybe be mobile or whatever, but you have to have a fleet of boats, whether it's flat water or white water. You have to manage that. You have to hire people for it. You have to have like liability, insurance, all that. And, and while we as a brand will eventually move towards having like proper liability insurance if we decide to branch out or whatever, um, Working in an outfitter or owning an outfitter means you have to have that from the start. You have to just, logistically, I think it's really difficult. And I've been on the receiving end already many times of like, hey, I'm scheduled to work this day and like it rains the day before. And I'm like, oh, cool. Let me now go take some like high schoolers and a little tour on this lake as all my friends are like running some crazy stuff. And then like I miss it, you know, and I don't, as an owner, I think that's even more that way. And so I don't necessarily want that in my life. I'd like to be able to be free enough to do where I want, whatever, whatever I want to do, where I want to go. Yeah, I mean, I get that. You, you, you want to be your own boss without the consequences of exactly. being the boss. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Which is, I think is admirable. I feel like everybody wants that to some extent. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like, I know even speaking for myself, like working a regular nine to five, there's so many days where I'm just like, oh God, I wish I didn't have to go into work today. Like it rained yet last night. I could, yeah. I could go to drive somewhere and go kayak. And don't be wrong, I still try to do that, but I think it's, like, I don't do it nearly as much as I'd want to, because I feel like if I was just like, hey, it's a little cloudy today, everybody, I think I'm going to call out of work, you know, just in the off chance that this river I'm really eyeballing right now yeah, runs. Like, that doesn't work in like, No. Yeah. And I, I wish it did, you know, I, 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 I uh, miss, like, my previous job, as we talked about off camera, where I was like, I'd have like random five days off, like every couple of weeks, and I'd be like, "Oh yeah, this is gonna this is gonna be a sick week of kayaking." Like, yeah. granted, my Subaru was not happy about the amount of miles I put on well, it within it's also a single year. Different but... though, because when you can get like a five day chunk in a row, you can go like go kayak and go camp and and everything and hang out and like just go river to river there. When you get just the weekend off, like you get off Friday. And then you drive somewhere and maybe you camp the whole weekend or maybe not. Maybe you have stuff you need to do because you have other things that happen in life. And so you like drive all the way out four hours to do like a day trip to a river and you kayak for two hours and then you drive four hours back home. And so it's just like you just drove eight hours to kayak for like two and a half. Oh, I mean, that's the story of my life at this point. You know, I think yeah. unfortunately like we live in central North Carolina and like 
being in Central North Carolina is nice because like everything is four hours away, you know. Three, you know, yeah. the clo- but the, it ends up being that like the closest decent river to me is the Watauga, and that's still two hours and fifty minutes away. I think Wilson is closer. Nope, Wilson's I've I've done further. the math. I've Wilson's done further. It's ten minutes of difference, but it's like a difference. You know what the closest decent water to us actually is? What? It's the White Water Center. I mean, it's you, not a real river, but yeah, it's yeah. The I wasn't there. factoring that in, but you're correct. It would be two hours away. Yeah, we got on the hall yesterday with yeah. Ira. Yeah, how did the Ira like the hall? Um, he he enjoyed it. I don't know if he'd ever drive two hours out here for the hog. Absolutely yet. not. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely not. The the middle was con- the, the middle is like a great beginner section, and I think there's a lot that people can learn there on the middle. Um, we also it was also really brutal for us dude like the behind the scenes stuff of the guide videos that ira makes because on the haw specifically but even a lot of rivers you have multiple lines for rapids and on the haw because it's so braided you have multiple rapids that you can only hit on like one lap like there's an island there's a wrapped on one side and the other and a wrapped on the other mm-hmm. so we ended up running like one of them and then hiking back up and running the next one and hiking back up and running the next one because the moose jaw rapid like area there's like five different ones oh 100 percent there's the there's obviously moose jaw then yeah. there's like depending on the, then there's several lines through moose jaw that you can run yeah but then you have obviously like maze which is yep. its own thing and then you have harold's tombstone far river left if you're not familiar with the ha there's a guide video coming out soon ish but yeah harold's tombstone all the way left for it's it's um it's similar to like oh dude that bug scared me yeah a little bit <laughs> I don't know if it's gonna if, if it's gonna get it his little oh it flew off yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's the beauty of uh, filming in nature I'm not gonna lie that startled me a little bit <laughs> dude I I like doing this in nature like I feel like this is so much cooler than like hi guys we're at the studio and um this is the same studio every time like this is cool like we have boats in the background we have like trees and and everything i assume the trees aren't in the shot but we have trees <laughs> yeah. around us we have like this is this is cool we should do this more yeah no and i mean and that's why i think for a long time i was kind of even when i was filming other content and i don't mm-hmm. wrong i i enjoyed it it never felt like it never quite captured the excitement that i had when i was doing my interview on the water interview stuff back when i first started what film. got you what gave you that idea like that's a i think it's a fantastic idea what what was like the inspiration for I'm going to do my interviews on the water. Uh, I like to talk, um, and I feel like that's like, and I love to kayak, and I, I know that that sounds so simple, but like anyone that actually knows me would, would be like, yeah, yeah, no, that, that sounds like a thought process that you would have in your head. <laughs> yeah. um, and I felt like no one was really doing a whole lot of like interview stuff at the time. And don't get me wrong, there's always the, the stuff that Whitewater Sessions does or Kayak Magazine does, but obviously like, like, Doing a written interview versus doing a live interview is obviously way yeah, different. Yeah, totally different. Um, and while I think that the written interviews are incredible, like there's something to be said about a more off the cuff, like casual thing. And what's more off the cuff than being on the river? Yeah, no, absolutely, um, absolutely. I wish there was some like logistical things that were a little easier, like just the the whole thing of like getting mics on the water and filming is is a difficult part of the sport yeah and i mean that was the biggest thing like the amount of time i spent like even with my very novice like editing skills it was spent trying to balance out the white water noise as mm-hmm. much as possible so that way it was at least tolerable for the viewer um and it's tough like and i think unfortunately like out of fear of a like losing equipment it's uh-huh. like really expensive it's really hectic like one swim could mean like oh well the video is done like thousands of dollars yeah. gone too yeah. yeah exactly and i still think especially at the time where i was at with my paddling where i wasn't like not that i i don't swim now but like the risk of swimming was yeah. way higher and it's also i mean like when you're because we only started paddling what a couple of years ago you, you've paddled what, like three years now yeah i think i'm coming up on my third year or so okay. so my third year was in um october so i'm at three and a half now and so like three and a half years of paddling is it's it, it's a lot you can learn a lot but there's also always that risk of just like i get stuck in a hole and like get chundered and now my like two thousand dollar bag of camera and mics and everything just like disappears forever which yeah. is scary when you think about it. Like, I mean, 
you, like especially with you having you going to Chile, like, mm -hmm. and it obviously being like a record high flow year, like that had to be some of the most nerve wracking like paddling you've ever done um, in your life. At the beginning, yeah, but once you learn the rivers, it's not too bad. The other thing is I spent most of my time on the beginner intermediate trips. Mm -hmm. So I'm paddling like class three, maybe class four um, from time to time. Very little, very little fives, maybe none. Maybe none of them were fives. Um, I don't think any of them were. But it's all like four max, and I feel comfortable enough kayaking that like if I'm only on fours, I can, I can bring gear. Yeah, I mean that's fair. Um, but I mean there there had to like I feel like even then like it's still a it still happens it swims yeah, happen no, but I also did. b you're also in a foreign country at that point. True, I did I did swim in Chile. I swam on the upper Palguin, that little like stupid hole that no one ever talks about after the the three drops. Um, it's walled in and then just. I just swam. Um, I went in it and like totally missed where I needed to boof and just hit the wall and got sucked in and swam. But I didn't have any camera equipment that day. I was just, it was like a for fun lap. So I was okay there. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, like it, it is kind of nerve wracking a little bit. Like I was super nervous before I went to Chile, but I also think it's really important to do things that, that scare you. And I'm not saying like, just like throw yourself into fear because I don't think that's the answer, but working up to it. Cause like, yeah, I've never been to Chile before, but I've been to other countries. Yeah. Um, I've lived out of my car successfully, I guess, depending on your view of success, but my mind successfully for quite some time. I've kayaked for a little bit at that point. So like, it wasn't like it was completely out of what I could do. It was just far enough that I was like, oh, I'm nervous, but I think I can be successful here. And I, I think I was successful there. I mean, I had a lot of fun. I got pictures of people kayaking. I met a lot of cool people. I, I enjoyed it a lot. I mean, I think by the, the metric of what you were supposed to do while you're out there, I consider that a success, mm -hmm. you know? It's not like you meant to go change the world by like shooting kayaking photos. <laughs> True, but I also would argue that like, maybe you did change the world by shooting kayaking photos. That's a, that, I mean, that's a pretty high praise for okay. yourself. Okay, like, all right. I'm not <laughs> saying for, like, me specifically in that situation, but I do truly believe one person can change the world. I think that that's a beautiful outlook there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious, all right? Like, like, this is why I do what I do. This is why I instruct as well, because, like, dude, I made one video on the Tulula, which by the way, I don't actually, like I'm kind of embarrassed about that video now looking back because it was so far ago, you know? Um, but that video allowed you to get more into kayaking. I don't, was it, I don't know if it was the inspiration for you to like go get it less. It wasn't, let's, okay. not, let's not inflate your but ego still, more than needed. Still, <laughs> you went and kayaked more because of that, right? You, you did more kayaking related things and then now your life is completely different because you stepped into a kayak. Oh yeah, 100%. I mean, I honestly, and I've told this story before. I mean, the reason I got into kayaking was because I had been whitewater rafting when I was younger and then my wife convinced me, like got me a trip mm -hmm. for my birthday on the Ocoee. And I saw the kayakers and they were, I was like, man, those guys seem to have more fun than I am. And I wanted to go do that. Um, but I think what really helped push me to get crazy about kayaking was all the content that was out there mm -hmm. um and i think having that available for me was like enough to like keep my like hyper fixation on the sport long enough that i could commit my like free time and life yeah. to it. well think about too like you i feel like you're a pretty adventurous person like you're down to try adventurous things you're down to try new things but like imagine if you're someone that's not right and for whatever reason you picked kayaking as like this is the this is the the crazy thing that I'm going to do to get out of my comfort zone, and if that person sees literally any of the videos we or or anyone else has put out, or goes and gets a lesson from an instructor and that that like hooks them in, now they're doing a sport that they maybe never thought they could have done, right? They might have before looked at like Manahela Falls, which is a class three ish, and been like, oh, I I could never go through that, and in 
you know, five years, maybe they're running it. Maybe they're running even bigger stuff than that. And I think that has an impact on their life that that can't be discounted, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, I, I think that there's a definite component of, like, making it available and inspiring others that is important, no matter, like, what mm-hmm. the skill level is. I mean... Like, imagine how many people have seen your Tallulah video and then they finally run Tallulah and they're like, oh, yeah. like it's I think actually, I, yeah. I feel like it probably comes up more than you'd probably it, it like does. it to. <laughs> it does. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's also, like, anything in the in the creative process or when you're growing, like, if, you, if you've ever put videos out or made content or art or whatever, like, I'm sure you can relate to this, where, like, you do something and at the time it's the best you can do because you just don't know very much, you know? You're still learning. At the time it's the best you can do. And then now that that video is like two years old, I think, like I look back at it and I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe this is what, this is what I put out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but that, it's a continuing process because like the videos that I put out now that I'm like, oh, it's probably pretty good. Like I feel pretty good about it. In two years, I'm going to look back at these videos and be like, oh my God, I can't believe that's what I put out. You know, like it's, it's never ending. If you had to point to one thing, what would you say your biggest impact on the sport has been so far? Oh, biggest impact on the sport. That's really hard to say. That's really hard to say because I don't know the extent of my impact, you know? Well, I mean, like, like, even from, like, your small scope, like, your, like, biased perception of the world and what you've done, like, what experiences have you had that when you look back on, you can point to examples in your life and say, oh, that made an impact? So I think, I think my biggest impact, and for people that are watching this, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think my biggest impact is on the community that's that's starting to get into the sport and is wanting to progress in the sport. And what I mean by that is um, I think a lot of people that are already good at kayaking, they don't really care about what I put out. They might not care about what I put out um, because it's they're better than me, you know? Um, but the people that are still progressing, that are getting from that like class one to class two level or from that class two to class three level, Seeing someone out there that's a regular person that works a regular job just like they do, that um, is struggling to do a certain thing, like maybe they're struggling to learn to roll, maybe they're struggling to boof, maybe they're struggling to catch eddies, maybe they're struggling to, to be in control on the river, whatever it is. Um, having providing an environment where those guys can see us struggling with that same thing and being like, oh, you know, this is normal, this is a part of the process, and then helping make the sport more accessible. I realize it's probably more than one thing. So I guess if I had to narrow that down, it would be like helping beginners get through that bump of like, hey, I'm new and I suck and I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah, I mean, it's tough being in that space. I think we as people don't like being bad at things. I feel like everyone wants to immediately pick something up and be like, oh, I'm good at this now. Like, I, I'm, a, I'm a pro at this point. But obviously that's not the way that that life works for most people mm-hmm. um yeah you get your freaks of nature who pick something up and they're like yeah i got this yeah. now but I, I mean most people are gonna spend time and feel like man why am i doing this thing i'm terrible at it i mean myself included you know i think a lot of that and i've worked really hard on this is changing my mindset from like wow i'm really bad and i really want to get good and this sucks to like this is an opportunity to learn to get better maybe not just even like in kayaking but like across everything like i've really tried to adopt the mindset that like everything that happens is is a good thing you know like oh if i swam today like good that gave me an idea of what my limitations are and what i need to work on you know like oh i went and uh kayaked whatever river and i don't know lost my paddle like okay good that taught me like things that i need to work on maybe i need to work on holding off my paddle in a swim or if i lost it because i jammed it in some rocks okay managing how i control my paddle is going to be important too um i mean and and i when i say that like everything is good i truly mean everything is good like if i go and paddle and i get hurt and i'm out of paddling for six months like yes that sucks but also good now i can focus on resting and focusing on other parts of my life that aren't kayaking that i maybe have neglected and i've been really trying to work and get that mindset that like everything that happens is good and um when i can get in that mode like i genuinely feel like I'm a lot happier and, and, and it's okay to suck because like good now I've learned what I need to work on yeah I mean I, I think that that's a kind of beautiful mindset to have I think for anybody I think being able to remove the, this perception of like negatives and positives and mm-hmm. only have positives is great like 
I mean, I'm sure it's like, taxing to have it's that. It's hard, dude. I mean, like, I got food poisoning the other week, and I was like, how is this good? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, what can I spin out of this? But, but it was good because it allowed me to, like, instead of going everywhere, it, like, forced me to, to stop. Like, it forced me to stop and focus on resting and focus on, like, my priorities. Because when you're, like, throwing up in a toilet and then also pooping in that same toilet because you have food poisoning, <laughs> like... <laughs> That, uh, your focus is no longer, like, what river am I getting on? Where, what am I doing? What's due for work or whatever? Your focus is on, like, I just need to get better. And so it allowed me to, to reframe everything that's going on and be like, okay, now I need to just focus on my health. It allowed me to focus on, like, again, just none of the other distractions matter. My health right now and how I get over this food poisoning and how I survive through the situation is what's important. And by putting everything else to a stop, it it reframes like, okay, well, this thing that I was working really stressed about on doesn't matter, you know, like, like yeah. that can wait a few days. And that that's the good I've tried to get out of it. I mean, don't get me wrong, food poisoning really did suck. You know, I'm actually like, surprised yeah. you don't get food poisoning more often, to be honest. Wow. <laughs> like, and, like, and I mean this, I mean this in a, a nice way. Like, I feel like anybody's house that you have stayed at would, would say that probably the same thing, where you like eat miscellaneous like stuff in people's house. And then you're just like, yeah, I think you had something that was maybe a little past the expiration date. I, it was still good, though, and you've just, like, consumed it all in one go. That, that's, that's true. That is true, actually. Um, I don't know. I'd like to think I have a pretty tough stomach. But then, like, clearly not, because, because this food poisoning, like, I don't, destroyed I don't me. think you can have a tough enough stomach, Gary, that you can never get food poisoning. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I, don't, I don't think your gut biome is, like, Superman. Like it was, this one was bad, dude. This one was really, this was the f worst food poisoning I've ever gotten. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I mean, I wish I had like an immune stomach. Oh, you know what, dude? I got a question for you. Oh, okay. This I... is totally unrelated to everything we were talking about, but it popped in my head. So while I was in Chile, I had a customer ask me if I could have one superpower, but that superpower cannot be used in any conceivable way to fight crime. What I already have the answer. What's for your you? answer? Oh, I would, I would do it. I would have the power of persuasion because I. Okay, you can use that to fight crime, dude. You can't no, use it No, I'm not. Oh, at I, all so the like, there's no way I could possibly use it. I mean, to to a reasonable extent, because I feel like you could spin everything that way. But like, basically, no reasonable person or even like slightly unreasonable person could ever use it to fight crime. So like, super strength is out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Out. Yeah. Like, yeah. What would you go for? So see, the problem with that is I, like, as a comic book nerd, like, I feel like I can come up with a way for uh -huh. every superpower to be used to, to fight crime. Because the, the, the ability to fight crime isn't determined by what power you have. It's about what your intent for the power is. Yeah, but the, we're looking for a power that is so niche or useless that you can't use it. So, like, <laughs> let me give you my example that I, that I went with. Um, and I will, so I actually have two that I think of. And, and let me know if you think you can use these to fight crimes. So the first one, talking about what we were just talking about, is a stomach that can never get like stomach bugs or food poisoning or anything like that. Okay, yeah, that's easy. Like, uh, okay, in the example of uh, like there was a church, like there was like a cult that poisoned like lettuce okay. in like in, in Arizona or something. You could eat all the lettuce and prevent uh, like a food poisoning outbreak. <laughs> that's such a niche. Okay, all like, right. I, my no, no, but I got you. I got you. All right. My second thing was. If I can conjure up a shell driver that can only drive shuttle. So, like, it only exists for me to go from the shuttle location to the next shuttle location, and then they vanish after that. So, like, I could run a river, conjure up my shuttle driver, get to my And whatever. it has to be from a river to a river. Well, it has to be that shuttle location to, the, to what the next And so, you, it, it, so you, you can determine whatever the shuttle location is, right? No, it has to be standardized. So, like, if I'm on Wilson, it would be from, like, the takeout to the put-in. Okay. Like, let's say, like, there are, let's say that there's, like, an environmental terrorist that you have tried <laughs> okay, to, dude. like, what I'm saying is that there's always a world in which you okay, can fight right, crime, look, because but... crime is not, like, the power to, like, dude, it's the Spider-Man quote, like, you know, or the Tony Stark quote from the, it's like, if you, if you needed the suit mm -hmm. to be a hero, then you didn't deserve the suit in the first place. Like, you need to be a hero right. for the, Let like, before the power the question, comes to you. Okay, it can't be something that, like, it would have to be a super, super niche example, like the cult thing, <laughs> or an environmental terrorist being 
exactly in the path of the shuttle for like like that's the realm of superpowers i'm talking about i'm not talking like super strength or like extra no no i'm with you right, I'm so just what's saying. your what's your superpower then in that realm I, I still stand by that if based on the limitations of the question then there is no way for you to not be able to fight crime with it okay but for a reasonable person to easily do because if you say persuasion right like i could literally walk up to a like some dude robbing a bank and be like hey don't do that and my persuasion powers would stop them but if i can only run shuttle with my conjured up shuttle driver like you can hit him with your car okay dude i'm not wilson <laughs> there's no bank even close to that bro <laughs> I'd have to be, like, on the James or something where I'm driving yeah, hey, through town. See? That's an example. Okay, in that one <laughs> specific spot of shuttle, if someone robbed any, the bank... That's any urban environment. If I'm shuttling from one urban river to another urban river, dude, I could definitely hit somebody no, no, with my car. No, one urban river to the same urban river. Dude, there's a lot of people I could hit with my car. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be like, all right, stop that dude, he's robbing a bank. All right, get my shuttle driver, and we're going to time it so that way when I'm running shuttle, because you can't do it any other time, when I'm finished with this river, I happen to come through and hit this dude robbing the bank. Yeah. I mean, okay, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. What's your superpower, though? You still got to come up with a superpower. Oh, dude, I think based... I, I don't know. I, um, I'll have to get back to you on that, because I, I think based on that, I have no idea what my power would be. <laughs> um... Because, like, I would say, like, oh, I could I could charge my phone with my hand. But then I'm like, I could use that phone to call 911, you know? You're going to, like, electrocute crime. someone, too. Just, like, touch them and... No, I'm just oh, saying... Oh, dude, you could be the best, like, like paramedic ever, bro. You just, you just... Yeah, and so my point is, like, is that there's so many applications of so many different things that mm -hmm. being able to stop crime is totally dependent on your desire dude, to stop you would crime. Be, I, don't, I don't think this is how medicine actually works, but, like, imagine someone's having a heart attack. You could, like, call 911 off your hand and then, like defibrillate them that is not how I feel that like works actually just, that, no, please don't not, do that that's yeah. not how that works i don't think anyone can do it Jared. i don't <laughs> think you needed the disclaimer there <laughs> all right um we went super off topic let's get back to to kayaking and, and stuff so i guess my my last question for you would be like with everything that's happened in, in the last year of mm -hmm. the portage posse what do you want to achieve within the next year of the within posse? the next year um to be honest i haven't put a ton of thought into that because I currently am having some personal housing issues. My element is, is breaking down. I have low compression in one of my cylinders. Um, and rather than trying to fix that or like get a replacement engine, because I don't think that really is, is worth it, I want to take this opportunity to grow and to upgrade. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually maybe looking at a van later today after we record this. But if that happens, like my priority is getting that van into something that I can live out of so I'm no longer homeless. Um, and then after that, everything else. So assuming I can get this van build taken care of relatively quickly and relatively reasonably. Is that the same Beetle? I don't know. Um, relatively quickly and re relatively like good time frame and reasonable cost. I'd like to get this channel to where um, we have like shirts and, and other merch coming out i think that would be really cool i think potentially doing some public events so maybe if we did like us um at a river i don't know whatever river um or we could support some clinics so like if we had beginner or intermediate clinics or like first timer clinics we go out and support them um in terms of filming i'd like to film more projects that are like more focused because right now, I think in the past, it's a lot of like, hey, we went to this river and we had fun and that's great. But there's so many things about the sport that I want to dive into. So like, just off the top of my head, an example I can think of is it would be really, really cool if we met up with like Dennis Huntley or one of those older legends and was like, hey, can you take us through like what it was like to paddle your 17 foot aluminum canoe back in the day through like pretty gnarly class four? You know, and, and, and kind of tell those stories. Yeah, I mean, and that's something that I've always wanted to do, but I've never felt that I've had, like, I guess, the skill to do it. Because I feel like if you don't do it right, it is a disservice to the thing yeah, that you're no, doing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But, like, not only that, but, like, also us having fun. Like, I think it would be cool if we went out and it wasn't, the mission wasn't, hey, let's go and find a river and just kayak it and record it. But the mission was, like, hey, we're going to bring 
this boat, whatever boat it is, to this river, and we're gonna like take turns in this boat, and instead of doing like a, a review that's like, hey, this is the size and length of the boat, and this is what it's good at, or whatever, and like there's plenty of people that do that, and they do that really well, and honestly, I'm not gonna do that well enough to even like go watch Wade's video or Matt's video that, that would do it better. But if we went out with the boat, and it was like three or four of us, and just had fun with the boat, and gave a review from the perspective, not of like, these are the physical stats of this boat, but like, was it fun, you know? Did it do this thing well? Like, what if we all ran this drop or whatever with the same boat? Like, how did we feel about it? What if we ran it backwards? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, does the boat do well backwards? Like, silly things like that. Because the reality is, if you want a good, like, these are the specs of the boat review, please go watch Wade's reviews or Matt's reviews or literally any of the other guys that do boat reviews. They, they will do that far better than I will do that. But if it's like, hey, is 10 foot falls actually 10 feet? Scorch is 10 feet. Scorch X is. Yeah. You want to line the Scorch X stuff on 10 foot falls? Yeah, that would be pretty cool. How, I don't know how we'd do it. No idea. I feel like it'd probably be a hazard to somebody. But oh, maybe. dude, we'd have to definitely block the river off because like, it would be ropes and stuff. Um, that is an ant. Um, it'd definitely be ropes and stuff, but like, we could do it. Or we could have like Clara take a picture as we're going down, you know, and mm -hmm. see if we can slot it to be exactly 10 feet, whatever. You know, like just fun things like that. Like I want to expand into the realm of like, hey, it's not just like kayaking stouts, because don't get me wrong, that's really cool, but that's not the focus. It's kayaking cool things, having fun doing cool things as regular people, and like just kind of sharing the joy and the stoke of the sport. Mm, okay, I know I said last question, but last, last question. Okay. What's been your favorite part of, I guess, your kayaking career so far? Are we looking for like a specific moment or just like a more overall? Uh, I, I, I think the more specific, the better. I'm not going to say you have to give a specific moment, but I think that being able to give a, as specific of an idea, like I don't want you to give me a concept. No, I want something uh, like want, tangible. Okay, tangible. Okay. Um, ooh, I feel like it's hard because there's so many moments that like I cherish from the sport. Um, Honestly, it's really, really hard to pick. There are so many good moments. I think uh, I think one in particular, just like one of the many, is um, the first time I ran the green, I ran go left, and it was a group where it was like myself and, and like there was like 10 of us, I think. It was a lot of people. And like they all came out to – to help with my PFD and everything. And like I ran go left, um, which I wasn't intending to run until like, it was like a last moment decision. You know, like I was in the eddy above it and I was like, you just kind of like flow state kicks in and all of a sudden like every decision you make is the right decision. Yeah. And it always works. You know what I'm talking about? I know like, exactly when, what you're like, talking that about. that state yeah. kicks in and like flow state kicked in and it was like, you can run go left. And I was like, okay, so I made the decision to run it and like hit it really well. Um, and like everyone's like cheering and everything. That moment was was huge. That that would be one of my favorite moments for sure. But like again, there's just so much that this sport has given me, and like there's so many moments I cherish that that might not even sound as cool. But like like showing Ira down the Ha, you know, like that's the river I started on, and, and having a friend of mine being able to see that river and experience it is is really cool. You know, when we um went just on the on the haw again the other day when we scouted that little like that's called the slot by the way it is actually on aw oh fair so so we scouted this thing that we didn't know was on aw and we we're like can you run down this side and we ran it you know like that's really cool like little moments like that or um when uh when me and you ran like Tallulah together or chioa together like just there's so many things here that Oh, dude, the first Wilson lap we ran, the high water one. Yeah. The first high water Wilson lap. Like, that's a great moment, you know? And it's just, there's so many moments that I cherish that even though this go left situation, this go left moment is, like, a big one, and it's something that I think everyone understands the scope of, um, little moments are big, too. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I think that's why it's important to cherish every, cherish every moment, because yeah. every moment could be the next big one. Yeah, I mean, like, even, I don't know, maybe I'm weird here, but, like, I enjoy the discomfort and stuff, too, right? Like, um, I'm using Clara as an example because they're behind the camera, but, like, me and Clara went and ran um, Great Falls, the, the Great Falls Park in South Carolina, 
and we ran like through all the the natural portions too like past man-made and paddle across the lake and attempted to hitchhike which didn't work so we ended up walking like eight miles back to our car in the dark and like i really enjoyed that trip like that was really fun um if you're not someone that likes walking eight miles then like maybe that's not as fun but like i i really enjoyed it like those moments are to me are more important than like i don't know your, your like traditional staple like big rapid moments yeah. even though those matter too like they're it all everything everything matters. is matter the other thing is important everything yeah. was awesome yeah well sweet well it's been a pleasure jer i yeah. love you buddy love you too man love you too another great episode in the books yeah. thanks everyone thanks clara too <laughs>